Hello, and welcome back. This week, I decided I wanted to redo one of the first videos that got any real traction on my channel. Five of the worst tanks in history according to a tanker. Mostly because the audio was shite and my editing skills left a lot to be desired, but my skills are better now, my audio is much better, and with all of that out of the way, shall we begin? Hello and welcome back to an episode of A Tanker's View with me, your average tanker, Tony. Like I said in the intro about 10 seconds ago, I am going to redo my video that I did last year at about this time of the five worst tanks in history. This is my opinion. I did no research to this, well, tens of minutes of research of this. And uh, with all of that, hey, look, I've got some socials. Please do like, share, subscribe. And if you want, there's also Patreon, Ko-fi. And now I've got channel memberships. They all cost the same. They all give the same perks. It's a buck ninety-nine, and you get access to Discord, voting on videos, access to videos before they release, and monthly watch parties. This week we are doing next week, sorry, we are doing Hell's Reach. Now, if you're all wondering why I wanted to redo this video, aside from the obvious production issues. Money! <laughs> The CPMs in January suck. Everyone who's on YouTube knows it this, and so I wanted to redo it and see if I can't get any better traction of it now that I can get some better production value out of my stuff. So, first thing, this is my opinion. These are all just allegedly, and if you don't like the fact that it's just my opinion, go somewhere else. Make your own video, tag me in it, and I'll gladly watch it, what you think the five worst tanks in history were. These are just my own personal opinion. Now to begin, there are some rules. Why? I want to keep those keyboard warriors in check. Because if there's one thing that's just absolutely polarizing on the internet, it's having an opinion. <laughs> so, rules. See them? Good. If you're visually impaired, uh, take my word for it. Trust me, bro. It came to me in a dream. So rule number one is going to be, the tank has to have actually seen combat. No prototypes and no display model, so no T-14 Armada, no KF-51 Panther, or anything like that. Two, it has to have been a purpose-built tank, so no modified farm equipment. And three, it has to have had at least a full production run or a partial production run at the time it saw combat. As you can see, this is not an exhaustive list, but we are not going to see stuff like the Bob sample, the mouse, or any of that crap on here, because they don't meet my exacting requirements because I am a man of culture. Now, this is going to include all tanks in all generations, from the Great War all the way up to the Russian-Ukrainian ass-kicking of 2022. Details and specifications? <laughs> Not what the tens of minutes of research I have done on the subject. Who needs it? It's an opinion. This is for fun. And I'm just going to tell you why these things sucked and that any opinion contrary to that is just plain wrong. If that's not going to get you typing in the comments and get some engagement, I don't know what will at this point. <laughs> so without any further ado, let's start the show. Number five is the T-90MS. The T-90MS is Russia's most advanced tank in service right now, aside from the quote-unquote T-14 Armada, which is... Uh, where is the T-14 Armada? Where T-14 Armada? What is the T-14 Armada? And if you want to see what my opinion on the T-14 Armada is, check out this video right here. Now, the T-90 MS is not a great tank. Hell, it's not even a competent tank. The T-90 is the child of a bastard, stagnant Soviet thinking. This tank is basically Piter and Igor uh, spent all of their money that was supposed to spend on designing a new tank and decided to get, uh, I don't know, vodka off their tits and basically took the T-68 and said, uh, change it just a little bit so it doesn't look like we're handing in the same homework. That's what happened there. This is a tank that hasn't improved its design at all since the late 60s. And it's so poor and so incapable that, hell, even just recently as this week, two Bradleys managed to smoke one with the 25 mil mic mic. Like, that says it all right there. So, decide Russia thought this tank was so incapable and poor itself that it decided to shit can the whole line in a flash of brilliance that they even have once in a while and decided to just spend that money instead updating the T-72s. That tells you a lot. 
<laughs> now they've been blown up in Chechnya, Syria, the Ukraine, and Georgia. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Ukraine actually might have more operational T-90s right now than Russia does. So because of the relatively abysmal modern status and abysmal performance record, the T-90 just, just, just edges its way onto the bottom status of my list at number five. As a final note, you know what? I'm sure if the tank had been designed as intended and most of its parts weren't scavenged from dishwashers and, uh, you know, 40-year-old computers, I'm sure the tank might not have sucked so bad, but that's not how Russia do. On to number four. This is most likely to be the most controversial part of my video, where I watch my retention rate sharply climb straight into the gutter. Just like my hairline. My number four spot is going to go to the battered iron knuckles of the Soviet fast fleet of tanks. The overhyped, the overwielded, and the overlionized T-34. This tank has been sucked off so hard by the post-war world, especially given the revisionist history we've seen lately. Um, this thing should probably get its own channel on the hub. For those of you quickly rushing to the comments to yell at me, if your greasy ponytail hasn't pulled everything above your eyebrows so tight it's inadvertently caught off the blood flow to your brain, let me remind you of this. The Soviets designed, built, and constructed this thing at a time when they sent anyone to the gulag who had more than a room temperature IQ. Not exactly the best, you know, way going forward for your QC inside your war factories. Just saying that should tell you something about this tank right then and there. Right up until the introduction of the post-war T-34. I believe it was the T-34-85-84 or 84-85. Anyway, the T-34 itself was wrapped in so many mechanical and workmanship issues, it was just as likely to break down and stop in its tracks due to a temperamental transmission, shitty gearboxes, bad metallurgy, as it was to friendly fire or even enemy fire. Its armor often was so overhardened or underhardened, or even in some cases just case hardened. Zero quality control issues whatsoever. This resulted often in armor that was so breathtakingly brittle you could crack its welds with a heavy machine gun. And before anyone screams at me, must sloped armor, guess what? We have known about sloped armor since time immemorial. It wasn't just some introduction that the Soviets came up with and the whole collective world went. Gee gosh, why did we think of that? No, that's not how this works. It's just, it was sloped at the right angle, and that's its advantage. It wasn't some mystery thing that they stumbled upon. Honestly, there's a whole like 30 minute video on Laser Pig's channel about why the T 34 sucks more <laughs> than German porn. So if you want, go over and watch it. I, I'll just wind up repeating everything he said anyway. So with that, it gets the number four spot on my list. And in my number three position, and here's where things are going to get a little crazy. From the other side of the ocean comes the giant lumbering pile of parts and guns known as the M3 Lee and or Grant. The M3 Grant if you're American, the M3 Lee if you're British. The sense of irony is not escape me whatsoever. Am I going to talk about it? No. So, the massive M3 tank was conceived early on in World War II as a way to mount the 76mm gun onto a tank. America didn't have the capability at the time. So, a quick little bit of history on this one here. You see the General Lee here, along with the good old Duke boys, were in a time when America should have known better, but couldn't give enough of a fuck to care. American factories at the time lacked the production capability to produce tanks that could mount a 76mm gun. So, what did they do? Well, instead of anything of value, you got this. Now I know it was a stock gap measure, but let's look at the flaws. Main gun, out of standard, check. Terrible arcs, check. Can't go hull down, check, check. <sighs> this, well, you know what? This thing's got more guns than John frickin' Wayne, so yeah, awesome. If you've got a terrible memory in parking lots too, no worries, chum. This thing was so loud and so tall, you could see it coming from miles away. And it was roomy. Certainly so roomy, in fact, that 
All of those rivets, bullets, and pieces of broken armor had plenty of room to bounce around on the inside and shred your crew. <sighs> this thing was most widely known for the North Africa campaign and its use with the British. You remember those British? Well, they had to leave everything on the beaches of Dunkirk. The U.S., extremely unimpressed with their dad's senior moment he's having and forgetting how to empire, decided to do something about this. So they decided to get a capitalist mega boner in the form of Lend-Lease and mass-produce these puppies to get the British back in the fight. And that they did. So despite 4,000 of these puppies being produced, it was quickly relegated to rear service and training rules and pretty much just given to the colonial allies. Because both the British and the Americans, Canadians, everyone decided to, you know, go with the Sherman instead. It was a bit of a better tank for the course. Yeah, I know it was a stop, yeah, but it's still an ugly effing tank. We're getting closer. Number two. And this is the oldest entry on my list. It's also the least produced tank on my list. Let me lay the story up here for you. It's the Great War. It's 1915. Hans and Johan are bitching about their frau lines in the trench while scratching their asses and hoping to go back home. Suddenly they hear a loud clanking noise and it's getting louder and louder. Out of the fog they see these lumbering tracked behemoths that their maxims can't seem to do anything about. They quickly fill their leader hosen full of shizen and go running for their lives. This was the introduction of the tank. And it quickly broke the stalemate for the first time in years. Now, the Germans took this iron fisting for a few years before returning to the battlefield with their own. Now, instead of, you know, taking the lessons learned from the tanks they captured along the way, the Shars, the Mark 1s and 4s, and all of that good stuff, they decided to shovel that straight into the shit pile and Ah, <sighs> produced this. And thus began the love of the German box on tracks, which they so lovingly just kept to that design all the way up into the future. <sighs> and, well, they gave us this instead. So, oh, there's just no describing it. it. It's just awful. Everything about this is awful, from its ground clearance, its armor sloping, its power. Everything about this is just wrong. There's, the guns are wrong. Anyway, before I reveal my number one, here are some of the honorable mentions. Finally, number one, Ichiban, the Imperial Japanese, T-95, Hago. Imperial Japan, not the fun-loving, high-tech land of waifus and, you know, strength degenerate porn that we know of and love today. No, Imperial Japan was bad. Like, really, really bad. Speedrunning war crimes bad. And let's face it, they also weren't exactly known for making the highest quality of tanks. Now, the most rational explanation for this is most of Japan's operations were either in dense jungles, or a mix of very steep mountainous terrain in China, or the beaches and terrain of the islands of the Pacific. And islands, and lots and lots and lots of islands. Islands. So heavy tanks were pretty much out of the question right off the hop. Japan instead decided to produce a light tank. Tried. Really tried. I'd give you a gold star, but... And you might as well just not have tried because you produced a light tank that was so wildly undergunned, under-armored, under-powered, and really only effective when facing token resistance because anything more than a swift kick to the shins would blow this thing the F up. Yeah. And given that these things were supposed to be fast to offset the disadvantages of the weak armor and light guns, it couldn't even do that right. Because the open track suspension that they put on this thing was so unimpressive that mud and light rocks and gravel would get jammed up inside it, break the tracks, and it'd be useless. And as a final scathing indictment of Imperial Japanese OSHA regulations, comes the final kick to the giggles. This tank, with its severely cramped interior, guess what it was lined with? Wait for it... Asbestos! Attention, if you or a loved one was diagnosed with mesothelioma, you may be entitled to financial compensation. Because if getting perforated by bullets, small and rivets, with paper-thin armor wasn't bad enough, fuck it. You get cancer too. I could go on for days about how piss-poor this tank was and how poor the design was, 
and in fact it was really a toss-up between this and the Italian M14-91 but at least the Italians saw where they screwed up and tried to fix it the Imperial Japanese just shoved bamboo shoots in the ears yelled bonsai and uh, took off running with this yeah anyways that is my list of top five crappiest tanks of all time. If you like my content, again, please do like, share, subscribe. And with all of that, guys, I will see you next time. Peace. Your way takes me forever to get anything done. <laughs> All right, sorry buddy, I gotta put you down. <clears throat>